Hi, I'm Sky Mara Thaler. Welcome to Rooftops of the Solar System. Today, we find ourselves venturing out into the realm of the ice giants. But before we start this adventure, take a moment to click the like and red subscribe buttons below to support this channel and to receive all the updates for Rooftops of America and Rooftops of the Solar System. day on Uranus is worth a lifetime. Our astro-pointing journey now takes us into a distant realm, that of the ice giants, a dark, cold, and mysterious place. When it comes to planets of mystery, the ice giants are the poster children. They are the least explored planets in our solar system. The ice giants often get lumped in with Jupiter and Saturn, but they really shouldn't. They are a different type of planet, especially when you compare them to those two monsters. Yes, they do have some similarities. They are gaseous worlds, but the gases that make up the ice giants are different than what you'd find in the larger two gas giants. Yes, they are stormy places, but the weather and Uranus and Neptune is some of the most extreme that you'll find in our entire solar system. On observation, the most noticeable difference is in their size. Both ice giants are magnitudes smaller than their larger siblings. The coloration is different as well, the ice giants being much more blue-toned than brightly banded Jupiter or golden Saturn. Both of these facts are related to their birth mainly where and when the ice giants formed. These two worlds took a slightly different path in their formation than Saturn and Jupiter. Both Uranus and Neptune formed further out and in colder temperatures. In an interesting note though, that area formation was actually closer to the sun than where we find these two planets today. But more on that when we get to Neptune. That meant they were less exposed to solar wind, which meant different materials for their formation. One of the other factors at play here is they both started later in the game. Jupiter and Saturn having a head start in gobbling up the material left over by the formation of our sun. So for Uranus and Neptune, that meant the types of things they were able to aggregate was less. This left two worlds that pulled together less and different types of material, yielding a different type of planet. Both Uranus and Neptune appear to have dense rocky cores that are proportionally larger than what we find at Jupiter and Saturn. Also, unlike their larger gas giant siblings, who are predominantly hydrogen and helium, the ice giants have much less of these elements. With their makeup, being only about 20% hydrogen and helium. Instead, a majority of their gases are made up of ices, hence their name, ice giants, because they have more ices in their atmosphere, water, methane, and ammonia. Those materials are also what give these ice giants their blue coloring. The first real challenge for prospective astro pointers who want to explore the ice giants is actually getting there. These planets are far out compared to the closer six major planets. We're no longer talking of millions of miles. We're now talking billions. Just the sheer distance from Earth is part of the reason these planets have only been visited just once by human spacecraft. It took Voyager 2, going at an average speed of about 35,000 miles per hour, four and a half years to get from Saturn to Uranus. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. Uranus was discovered in 1781 by William Herschel, but perhaps a better way to describe it is 
William Herschel was the first person to positively identify Uranus as a planet. Despite being over twice the distance from the sun that Saturn is, Uranus orbiting at about 1.8 billion miles from the sun on average, you can actually see this planet with the naked eye. Now, it's incredibly dim and conditions to see it have to be just about perfect, but it is there. Early astronomers had actually seen Uranus, but because of its incredibly slow and ponderous orbit around the sun, taking about 84 years, more than the average human lifespan, it often got misidentified as a star because they just didn't recognize it for what it actually was. Herschel had been surveying stars with a magnitude of eight, stars that aren't visible to the human eye. It's during these observations he spotted something interesting. He noted an object moving in front of the star field that was just at the edge of human visibility. Even Herschel, upon first observation, thought Uranus was something different than what it turned out to be. He initially came to the same conclusion as his predecessors, that this was a star, but something about that didn't quite fit. It was too close to Earth to be a star, so upon further observation he reassessed, and his second thought was this was a comet. Further detailed observations finally revealed the truth. This distant object was actually a planet. It'd take another two years for Uranus to be officially declared a planet. But in the meantime, it made Herschel a celebrity. This was the first planet discovered with a telescope. But more than that, it expanded the boundaries of our solar system. Because this was the first new planet discovered since humans started charting the skies way back millennia before. It's pretty heady stuff. Herschel, being politically astute, originally proposed the planet to be named after King George III of Great Britain, though pretty much everyone else in the scientific community didn't agree. Instead, the name Uranus came from Johann Ehlert Bode, a German astronomer. His proposal was based on mythological order. Jupiter is the son of Saturn, and Saturn is the son of Uranus. It's the only major planet named after a Greek god. This is also where we get the name for the element Uranium, the element being named in support and honor of the planet. Over the next few decades, a clearer picture would emerge. The planet would gain some moons, Herschel himself discovering Titania and Oberon, William Lassell, one of the great amateur astronomers of the 19th century, discovered Umbriel and Ariel, and in 1948, Gerard Kuiper identified Miranda. Then, almost 200 years after Herschel originally identified Uranus as a planet, astronomers discovered it had a ring system. Plus, there was also the weird fact that it appeared to be flipped on its side. Beyond that, there wasn't much else that could be figured out about Uranus. The planet remained a mystery. Most of this was due to the immense distance and the limitations of ground-based telescopes. If humans wanted a better understanding of this world, well, they'd have to go there. And fortunately for us, we had just the right tool to do it. In January 1986, humanity got its first up-close look at Uranus, and the results were a bit, well, lackluster. Unfortunately, Uranus clearly hadn't gotten the message that its distant neighbors were swinging by for a tour. And when imaged, the planet looked rather plain, and almost devoid of any atmospheric details. After the amazing discoveries of Jupiter and Saturn, the seventh planet seemed like a flop. In a funny coincidence, it all came down to timing. 
Voyager 2 was able to use the alignment of the planets to actually reach Uranus. But by the time it arrived, it was quite possibly the worst possible time for it. It was Uranus's summer solstice. So the world that Voyager 2 saw looked rather uniform and frankly bland. And this, this gave Uranus a bit of a reputation as a boring planet. But that's not the case. This world is anything but boring. That veneer of calmness that Voyager saw was just a facade because Uranus is quite possibly the weirdest and most extreme planet in our entire solar system. And considering with everything we've seen on our journey so far, that's pretty wild. The irony is Voyager 2 was this great opportunity to unlock some of the mysteries of this planet, but Uranus managed to keep more than a fair share of its secrets locked away. Not all of them were safe, though. In the five days of its visit, Voyager 2 discovered 10 satellites, two additional rings, and, most important for us, gave us a peek of the surface of the five major Uranian moons. On a personal note, it's also the timing of this visit that made Uranus my favorite planet in the entire solar system. I was 11 years old when Voyager swung by Uranus, and it left an indelible impression on me, one that's never released its hold my entire life. I knew about the visits to Saturn and Jupiter by looking through old National Geographics, but Uranus, this was happening in real time. You could watch the images coming back on the nightly news, and me being totally into everything space, this was amazing. I remember in fifth grade even getting it in the weekly reader and being able to read about it. It truly was exciting. In the decades following Voyager's visit, further study of Uranus by the Hubble Space Telescope and other more powerful ground-based telescopes have shown that Uranus can be quite the rough place, particularly when approaching its equinoxes. Observations have shown a planet racked by intense storms and shifts in the weather. All of these things have to do with Uranus's axial tilt. To say that it's severe is a bit of an understatement. Uranus is quite literally pushed over on its side at 98 degrees. It doesn't really wobble through space like Earth or most of the other planets as much as roll through space. It's more akin to a bowling ball than a top. And because Uranus loves to lean into its weird nature, it also spins in the opposite direction on its axis. So the big question is actually quite simple. What happened? The going theory is it suffered a collision or maybe multiple collisions that hit with enough force and at the right angle to tip the planet over. Perhaps a protoplanet early in the creation of the solar system. Needless to say, to get to the situation we find today, the size of this object had to be large. Very large. There are some theories that state it was twice the size of Earth, which is pretty amazing as Earth is the largest terrestrial planet in our solar system. Incredibly, Uranus survived, and not only that, but it retained its atmosphere as well. This leads scientists to suspect the collision was a glancing blow, enough to tip the planet, but not blast it into smithereens. But wait, there's more! In recent simulations, scientists have calculated that 
If the size of the object that collided with Uranus was at least that of Earth, then not only would it have enough force and mass to push Uranus over onto its side, it also could have generated enough material to form the Uranian system of moons, them taking shape from the leftover debris of the impact. Uranus may have survived, but it didn't walk away unscathed. A lot of the weirdness of this planet, the tilt, the bitter cold temperatures, the incredibly disjointed magnetic field, can all be drawn back to this cataclysmic event. It shouldn't be any surprise, then, that this tilt provides something of a challenge for high pointers as well. Describing a Uranus day can be a bit of a mind bender. Yes, it rotates around its axis every 17 hours. You could chalk that up as a Uranian day, but if you wanted to compare it to say an Earth day from sunrise to sunrise, well, that's a completely different story. To experience something like that on Uranus, you better set aside some time because a day like that takes literally its entire revolution around the sun. 84 years where you will experience 42 years of daytime and 42 years of nighttime. It gets a bit weirder than that. Uranian seasons last 21 years, so not only would you get one Earth-type day, you'd also only experience each season only once. This extreme day, night, and seasonal pattern also extends to its moons, since they all orbit around the Uranian equator. Compared to their colleagues around the other planets, the Uranian system of moons appears to be more on a vertical plane than a horizontal plane. That means they are also subject to the same extremes that you find on Uranus, both the light and dark and seasonal ones. Uranus, like all the gas giants, has a ring system, and it's the second most complex in our solar system. It is fairly substantial as well, made up of 13 distinct rings divided into two main groups, the inner with nine and the outer with four. But like everything else about this planet, its ring system is a bit different. While the rings are still little understood, we do have some insights on them. Astronomers estimate their age to be about 600 million years old, fairly young in cosmic standards. We also know that they orbit relatively close to Uranus, starting about 23,500 miles from the center of the planet and then extending out to about 61,000 miles. The rings are rather thin, with a width of only a few miles across at most. They're thought to have been created by smaller moons that had edged too close to the ice giant and had been shattered by gravity. In turn, these shattered chunks collided with each other, slowly breaking down and spreading out into the rings we see today. Unlike Saturn's rings, which are bright and clearly visible with even a basic telescope, Uranus's rings are much darker, almost the color of, say, charcoal. That's not their only key difference, though. The Cronian system of rings is predominantly made up of water ice and ranges in size from particles of dust to large boulders. The Uranian rings don't appear to have that dust element. They all seem to be made up of material the size of a golf ball or bigger, and that's pretty weird. That missing component leads to a few questions. Did it ever have any dust material? And second, if it did, then where'd it go? This chaotic ring system also manages to stay relatively confined. And that's another riddle that puzzles scientists. 
but that riddle also leads us to why we're here at Uranus in the first place. It's system of moons. At present count, Uranus has 27 moons. But if lessons from Jupiter and Saturn tell us anything, there are probably more. The majority of these satellites weren't even discovered until the space age, the most recent, Margaret, being identified in 2003. They can be divided up into three groups, the inner moons, the irregular moons, and the major moons. If the names of Uranus's moons strike you as a bit different than what we've seen previously, well, you'd be correct. These moons are named after characters from the plays of William Shakespeare and the literary work of Alexander Pope. The Uranian system of moons seems to combine elements from both the Jovian and Cronian systems that we've already explored. The irregular moons take elements from both of those larger gas giants. Now, the major moons draw more comparison to the Jovian system, at least with uniformity in size. There are no huge outliers like Titan or distant relatives like Iapetus. As for the inner moons, they're more similar to what we find around Saturn. Well, at least with the shepherd moons and maintaining the ring structure. But here's one thing that does make Uranus's moons slightly different. They are the least massive of all the moon systems around the gas giants. If you would combine them all up, they would have less than half the mass of the moon Triton, which is the seventh largest moon in our solar system. The inner moons are a wild, chaotic, and little understood bunch of satellites seemingly imbued with a sort of live-fast-die-young cosmic fatalism. Voyager's discovery of these moons was one of its great findings during its time at Uranus. And the inner system is unlike anything else in our solar system. To say this is a crowded area of space is yet again one of those understatements. There are so many actors on the stage here that scientists have had some difficulty trying to figure out how they manage to not collide into each other. Take two of these satellites, for example, Belinda and Cupid. In their orbits, they get as, as close as 500 miles from each other. That's ridiculously close. The paths around the ice giants also change incredibly rapidly we're talking substantial shifts in orbit in the span of a decade. This is an incredibly dynamic system. It's believed some of these moons play an integral role in maintaining the ring system, but the connections with the rings may be even deeper. The moons may serve as reserves of material to refresh the rings, whether through deceleration or collision, these moons are destroyed and their material then distributed through the rings. From this material, new moons start to form, repeating the cycle. That's just a theory though. We do know that the location of several of these moons, their proximity to Uranus and the ice giant's gravitational pull is decelerating them and putting them on a path of destruction. Also, orbital projections show collisions for several others, such as Cressida and Desdemona. Now, for me, those Shakespearean names adds a bit of tragic and dramatic flair to these doomed satellites' cosmic destiny. Regardless, while a great many things have been uncovered about the inner moons, much remains unknown, including how many inner moons there actually are. To confirm some of these theories and hypotheses, we'd need to get a closer look at the makeup of these satellites, a feat 
only possible if we send another space probe to the system. For astro pointers, of particular interest may be the moon Puck. This mischievously named moon is the largest of the inner satellites, with a diameter of 93 miles. Whipping around Uranus at less than an Earth day, this is the ruler of this chaotic domain. Puck was discovered while Voyager was en route to Uranus, and fortunately it was early enough during its transit from Saturn that scientists were able to program the space probe to image Puck. This meant this satellite would be the only inner moon photographed in any detail. That said, the images that we did get of this world were only able to provide us with a few cursory details. We know that this gray little planet is relatively roundish in shape and that it has been cratered. The largest of these craters measuring in at about 27 miles in diameter, which considering how small Puck is, is pretty substantial. But beyond that, there is little else that we know of this place. The other recent satellites to have been added to Uranus's moon roster are the Irregulars. These all orbit at a distance beyond the major moons and are suspected of being captured objects, roped in by Uranus's gravitational pull. All of them have retrograde orbits, with one lone exception, Margaret. It is the only Uranian irregular moon with a prograde one. At this time, the largest of the irregular moons is Sycorax. This moon was discovered in 1997. And besides some very blurry images, little is known about it other than the fact that it is one of the farthest orbiting objects from Uranus at about 7.5 million miles. That's about 20 times farther than the most distant of the major moons. For the adventurous astro pointer journeying out to this distant moon, what you will find is a complete unknown. Sycorax has only been seen through telescopes, and information on it is scarce. We know it's bigger than Puck, with a diameter of 102 miles, and it takes a leisurely three and a half years to travel around the ice giant, and it is not actually tidally locked, rotating around its axis just under seven hours. These two stops at the inner and irregular moons, well, those are just the opening acts for the main event. The real reason we're here to visit the major moons. But before we really get into that adventure, I, we need to address the proverbial elephant in the room, so to speak. It's something alluded to already several times in this episode. To make it perfectly clear though, we don't have a very good view of Uranus. Our knowledge of it is woefully incomplete. The images that Voyager 2 took of this planet and its moons, well, at best, at best, only showed a bit over 40% of what actually is there. Not to take anything away from the incredible visit of Voyager 2, but it was just a flyby, one port of call on its grand tour. The fact remains, the images we have from up close were taken with technology that was state-of-the-art half a century ago, and the images themselves are getting close to 40 years old. With that in mind, in one of the weird quirks, because Uranus is tipped on its side, and therefore so are its major moons, when Voyager 2 imaged them, it basically just got shots of these moons' southern hemispheres. The tantalizing peak, or the glimpse that we did get of this world, just 
makes it more of a demand for us to send a comprehensive mission there, say like Cassini around Saturn or Juno around Jupiter. Here at Uranus though, we're gonna have to do something a little different. We're going to have to extrapolate or speculate on what some of these high points may be based on the limited knowledge we have. That said, that glimpse through the keyhole, well, it was pretty amazing. This final troop of moons has five members. Starting closest from the planet and heading out, they are Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon. Unlike the other two groups of satellites, these moons are, perhaps surprisingly, rather orderly. Uranus keeps its large moons relatively close at hand. All of them, except one, reside in the ice giant's magnetosphere, and even the most distant isn't that far from it, skirting through it at times as it orbits the planet. These moons do share a few commonalities amongst themselves. For starters, they're all made up of the same material, water ice and rock. And on top of that, they each seem to have the same amount of those two items on their composition. 50% water ice, 50% rock. Perhaps of biggest concern for astropointers is these moons seem to lack any current precise orbital resonance amongst themselves. This is different from Jupiter and Saturn, as we saw there with Io or Enceladus, this resonance generates tidal friction, that tug of war building energy, which in turn manifests itself in tectonic activity or volcanism as the energy looks to escape. Without this means, these worlds may be more staid, the high points older or created by external sources instead. These satellites are also more dense than their Cronian counterparts, yet another mystery that astronomers have to sort through. But perhaps most interesting for their shared features is the color of their surface. These moons are dark, which in turn gives them a low reflectivity. Ariel, the brightest of them, only reflects a third of the light it receives from the sun. Why they are this shade is still unsolved, though the current suspect is this has been brought about by Uranus's energetic and twisted magnetosphere. Scientists suspect a process called radiation darkening to be the chief contributor on the hue of the Uranian moon's surface. This radiation darkening works by interacting with organic compounds, in this case, methane. This process also reveals some of the challenges astropointers shall be facing once they arrive in system. As you can expect, Uranus's magnetosphere is not to be trifled with. While the ice giant's magnetosphere is not as strong as Jupiter's, it is stronger than Saturn's, so radiation shielding shall be critical while visiting. That radiation does have a benefit though. Uranus is cold, like really cold. Frankly, it's colder than it should be for an object at this distance from the sun. That's a whole nother bit of weirdness that scientists have to figure out as well. One of the really interesting things about Uranus is it is the coldest planet with an average temperature of 365 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But here's what's really interesting. Of all the gas giants, Uranus is the only one that does not produce any internal excess heat. Thanks to the radiation darkening of their surface though, the moons manage to absorb more solar energy and that keeps them warmer than they would be if they had a higher reflectivity. 
along with the radiation and cold, we'll also have to deal with the light, or in some cases, the lack of it. As mentioned earlier, you may be attempting your summits either in total light or total darkness. The poles are bathed in day or nighttime for decades. But with those all checked off, it's time to get to the surface of these moons. The first stop on our itinerary is not only one of the weirdest moons orbiting Uranus, but one of the strangest moons in our entire solar system. Miranda is a wreck of a world, with a surface unlike anything we have seen in our adventures so far. Compared to its siblings, this moon is something of a black sheep. Miranda was a bit late to the party. Discovered in 1948, it was the first Uranian moon spotted in almost a hundred years, and it'd be the last one found until Voyager would arrive on the scene 37 years later. In the beginning, though, there wasn't much that could be really said about it, other than that it was the innermost moon towards Uranus, and that it was the smallest, with a diameter of about 300 miles. Expectations were low for this moon. At best, astronomers thought it would be similar to Saturn's Mimas, but once Voyager was able to image it up close, what it found was unlike anything that had been seen before. From appearances alone, this is clearly a dynamic and extreme world, with a topography that is one of the most varied in our cosmic backyard. There are two things that really separate Miranda from its fellow colleagues. The first is its size. It is magnitude smaller than the other major Uranian moons. It is also one of the smallest objects we've discovered in our solar system that's been able to self-round through its own gravity. Then there is the second which truly sets Miranda apart not only from its fellows in the Uranus system, but also all the moons we've discovered in our solar system, and frankly, most of the planets. Miranda has the most extreme and wild variation of terrain yet discovered. And that leads to a couple big questions. One. How did this happen? And two, what forces or events occurred that created such a dynamic world? One of the original thoughts was Miranda was almost torn apart, but managed to pull itself back together. This almost breakup and reformation is proposed to have led to the weird Frankenstein-like appearance. Another scenario is that Miranda has been subject to substantial meteorite strikes that melted the surface and refroze over. That could serve as one possible explanation for one of the weirder formations on this moon, its coronae. Three of these features have been identified on Miranda. They are roughly trapezoid or oval shaped, standing out compared to the cratered and carved landscape, easy to spot by the concentric ridges and troughs. We've seen these features once before, back on the pressure cooker world of Venus. Now, Venus's coronae are the, what is thought to be the result of volcanism in a high pressure environment. Miranda, though, doesn't have some of these features. For one, it has no atmosphere, there's no air pressure, and two, it is small, like seven times smaller than our moon. So was it able to generate enough internal heating to create these 
formations. Perhaps it did, though. It could have been a perfect storm. Whatever cataclysm wrecked this moon, combined with its location and the tug of war from both Uranus and its fellow moons, churning its insides enough to generate enough energy to create Vulcanism. If that was the case, it would be absolutely incredible to see that kind of activity this far out in our solar system. Any Astro Pointer on Miranda shall want to stop by and take in these amazing landscapes. What has been seen in Miranda is hacked with deep canyons cutting across the surface, some estimated to be up to 12 times deeper than the Grand Canyon here on Earth. This moon's terrain not only varies in appearance and elevation, but also in time. Some elements appear very old, others much newer, and that's a clue that something may be going on inside as well. Perhaps some of these features came about from tectonic activity due to tidal heating, when this moon had an orbital resonance with next door neighbors Ariel and Umbriel. But for astro pointers and space tourists in general, there is one place on Miranda that demands a visit. The Verona Rupes. Rupes, in astronomical terms, are cliffs, and the Verona Rupes are currently the top contender for the tallest cliffs in our solar system. NASA estimates the cliff face to be about 12 miles in height. For comparison on Earth, the tallest vertical drop is just under 4,400 feet, not even a mile. This is, rightfully so, one of the wonders of our solar system. It's sort of hard for us to actually even visualize what this site would look like. There is really nothing like it here on Earth. Whether you were standing from the top or at the bottom of these cliffs, looking up or down, it would be absolutely incredible. Even say something comparable, like Valles Marineris and Mars, you would still have, well, clouds. You might not be able to see the bottom or the top. But you don't have that problem here in Miranda. There is no atmosphere. There would be no clouds. There'd be nothing to obscure your view. And you'd be able to take the entire thing in. And it would be absolutely one of the most astounding sights you'd ever see. If you were to jump off this cliff, it would take well over 10 minutes to reach the bottom. And despite Miranda having a very low gravity, less than 1% of Earth's, you wouldn't want to do this without something to slow you down. You'd pick up quite a bit of speed, accelerating to 120 miles an hour since there is no atmosphere to provide any resistance or drag. That also means a parachute won't work either. For Astro Pointer purposes, the Verona Rupes will have to be our Miranda High Point stand-in for the time being. While some peaks have been identified, their elevation has not been measured. Regardless, standing on the top of these cliffs will give you an absolutely incredible view of the surrounding landscape and a stunning view of Uranus itself. Considering that at best we've only seen about half of this moon, it would not be a surprise to me in the slightest if Miranda was the home to both the Uranian low point and high point. If there was one moon in this system that I could have a complete map of, this would be the place just to see how bonkers the train was on the dark side. But for now, we're going to leave Miranda and move on to our next destination. After the wildness of Miranda, Ariel may seem a bit tamer, but make no mistake, this moon has some interesting characteristics, 
and shows signs of having been shaped by tectonic forces as well. This moon is the 14th smallest of all known 19 spherical moons in our solar system, with a diameter of 719 miles. It's also the most reflective and brightest moon in the Iranian system. That's not saying too much though, because Ariel only reflects back about a third of the light that it receives. Now, Ariel's terrain, well, it's pretty much in line with what we've seen from other moons on our journey. A combination of craters, plains, and ridge and valley terrain. Of all the Iranian moons, Ariel is thought to have the youngest surface. Voyager's flyby revealed a world with a relatively smooth landscape. Another clue was found in the craters. Ariel has few large craters and many small ones. The older, larger craters appear to be partially submerged, meaning the landscape was resurfaced at some point. This is a major clue that while these are frigid worlds with bone-chilling surface temperatures, Ariel and its siblings may have hidden secrets below. Much like their counterparts around Saturn and Jupiter, the Uranian moons are thought to have subsurface oceans. And there is evidence suggesting that of all of them, Ariel is the one that would be most likely to have an active interior. And if that's the case, this would be an astounding finding. Once again, showing how prevalent liquid water is throughout our solar system. It's a fair bet to say tidal heating is the most likely culprit for Ariel's resurfacing and geological activity. At least, it was in the past. Ariel currently doesn't have any resonance with its fellow moons, but it clearly did at one point. This relationship created enough energy to produce what is currently the most captivating feature on this moon, its extensive canyon and rift valley network. A quick side note on this, because this issue of resonance is going to keep coming up. The Uranian moons have, let's call it a looser resonance than say their counterparts around Saturn or Jupiter. And this is all due to the fact that Uranus itself has a, well, it's not as oblate, which means it's not as squished as the larger gas giants. It's also because its moons are smaller. So what this means is the Uranian moons can slip out of their resonance easier than say Io or Enceladus. That also means on the flip side, they might be able to fall back into it at some point in the future. This network of canyons and rift valleys crisscrosses the entire surface that Voyager was able to image. And they stretch for hundreds of miles, reaching up to six miles in depth. The longest of them is Kachina Chasma, with a length of 385 miles. What's of peculiar interest in these canyons is their floors. They're smooth. And that's a strong indicator that they have went through some form of liquid erosion. Whether through cryovulcanism or geyser activity, we don't know. Nor do we know exactly what type of liquid caused this erosive activity. If it was water, well, it would have had to been loaded with some sort of antifreeze, because otherwise it would have frozen too quickly. There are other perpetrators that it could have been too, like say liquid ammonia or methane or even liquid carbon monoxide. Or maybe it was a combination of all of them. When it comes to a high point, we're gonna have to make an educated guess. There are several candidates. The first is the edges of the canyons themselves. Astro pointers may be able to find higher elevation on the rims of these features given height by the upheaval 
or cracking that created them. You may also want to investigate the rims or central basins of the craters. Ariel has its share of craters, but as already mentioned, they are not as prevalent here as on some of its Uranian siblings. The largest crater on Ariel is Yangur, measuring about 48 miles wide. Then there is our third guess, that perhaps the high point of Ariel is, say, similar to what we found with the Janiculum dorsa on Saturn's moon Dione. That perhaps the rooftop of Ariel rests on the summit of some ridge pushed up by tectonic activity. But that's the best we can do here, is guess. Because as it stands so far, there has been no officially identified high point for this moon. With that though, it's time to pack up and move on to our next destination. After Miranda and Ariel, our next destination, Umbriel, may not seem like much, but that would be a mistake. Where Ariel is the brightest of the major moons, Umbriel is the darkest, reflecting only 16% of the light that reaches its surface, only half of what Ariel reflects. This dark color gives Umbriel its name, Umbriel being the dusky melancholy sprite from the works of Alexander Pope. Umbra also means shadow in Latin. Umbriel is uniformly dark in its appearance with little variation in that. And that is a bit interesting because you'd expect to see some deviation there. This dark coloration presents a couple challenges. One of the first is trying to pick out any details in the landscape. They all seem to blend in and it gives this moon a rather bland appearance. As you might expect, this makes imaging and mapping problematic as well. What's even more interesting is the craters on this moon don't seem to have the traditional ejector rays you find on other impact sites around our solar system. This could well mean that whatever material coats Umbriel surface is rather thick as well. The big mystery is, why is Umbriel like this? One going theory is it is caused by a reaction of water ice on the surface with particles from Uranus's magnetosphere. But that's just a theory, and for right now, there is just not enough information to form a clear answer. Umbriel is mainly defined by its craters. It's the second most cratered moon orbiting Uranus. In fact, craters are the only landform on Umbriel that scientists have officially recognized. That's not to say that other land features aren't present. They are. The prerequisite canyons that we seem to find on all the Uranian major moons are here, but when Voyager visited, it didn't have the time or the necessary technology to get the close-up image or resolution needed for scientists to be able to discern the details. And that is incredibly frustrating. But with craters, well, there was some determinations that scientists were able to make. Umbrielian craters range in size from the smallest, at a mile, to the largest, around 130 miles in diameter. For astropointers, it appears many of the craters identified have central peaks, and that is a great sign for any potential climbing expeditions. Of course, the downside is there's no accurate determination on the elevation of these structures. Amongst this pockmarked surface though, there is one crater 
that really stands out compared to all the others. And it's with this where Umbriel's dark surface actually becomes advantageous because it helps highlight the contrast on what is this moon's most defining feature. Located near Umbriel's equator, this crater's official name is Wanda. And what makes it stand out so much is that its floor seems to be dazzling bright compared to the surrounding landscape. So much so that it's been nicknamed the Fluorescent Cheerio. Of course, this feature has a whole bunch of mysteries swirling around it. One of the going theories on how this area was created was that the impact that actually formed the crater exposed or brought up a material from underneath the surface that had a different reflectivity. And while that's a fairly straightforward explanation, in the end, it only actually just brings up even more questions. The material making up the fluorescent Cheerio is theorized to be a solid block of carbon dioxide ice, also commonly referred to as dry ice, that is trapped in some way, shape, or form at the bottom of the crater. And that's only a piece of a much larger puzzle about this construct. And there are many other questions that still remain, such as how long has it been there? How long will it last? And has this happened on other parts of Umbriel? The answers to these questions won't really be known until we actually get back to Uranus and are able to take a closer look. And the same goes with Umbriel's high point. If I was to speculate, I'd say that the Umbrellian high point is actually on the rim of a crater or maybe on one of those central peaks. But we just don't know. We don't have enough detail in the images that we got. And those images only covered at best 40% of the moon. For now though, we'll take a consolation prize and enjoy the contrasting environment around Wanda and get ready to move on to yet our next moon, Titania. Titania was the first moon to be discovered orbiting Uranus. William Herschel spotted it six years after identifying the planet. With a diameter of 986 miles, Titania is the largest and most massive of the Uranian moons. It is also the eighth largest moon in our solar system. It's named after the Queen of Fairies from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Since Titania is the largest moon around Uranus, this is the place where you will most feel the effects of gravity. But don't fret, because gravity here is only 4% of what you'd find back home on Earth. So let's say you weigh 150 pounds on good old terra firma. Well, you will be a featherweight six pounds on Titania. The best images of this moon show a rift valley network spanning the landscape, and of these, the Messina Casmata is the largest. What we've seen of it runs for over 900 miles from the south pole to the equator, though it may be longer. It also looks rather new compared to other features on the moon, cutting through some craters and very few craters laid over the top of it. Both are indicators that it may be rather young. On a superficial level, this appears awfully similar to the canyon network already found on Ariel. Now, a closer investigation might reveal some differences. It's been theorized that these canyons came about back when Titania was actually still cooling, but had an active interior. Titania's interior is thought to be like its Uranian counterparts, a combination of rock and water ice. As this liquid interior started to freeze up, it expanded, and this expansion led to the cracking and upheaval in its crust, 
resulting in the network of canyons and faults we see today on the surface. Some of these canyons can reach depths up to three miles. Titania is a tease. The best images that we got from Voyager 2 show landforms that run past the Terminator line into the shadows, fueling our imaginations of what could be there just out of our sight. Much like the other three moons we already visited, Titania doesn't have a definitive high point. But in this case, we may have a, let's call it, provisional high point that we can check out, and we'll find it in Titania's other major land feature, its craters. This satellite has its fair share of craters dotting the surface. Most of them measure about 80 miles or less. One, though, stands apart and is significantly larger. This crater is named Gertrude, and with a diameter of just over 200 miles, it is the largest known crater on Titania. That's about a fifth of the diameter of this moon. The rim of Gertrude is over a mile and a quarter high from the crater floor. That's a bit low for a crater this size, meaning the features here have settled over the millennia. But standing at the edge would give you an elevation of about 6,500 feet. As you stood on the rim and took in the surrounding view, you'd notice another landform in the distance, one that actually rose to a higher elevation where you presently were. See, Gertrude is a complex crater and it has a central spire. Well, more like a central dome these days, but the point stands. And this dome is a significant piece of real estate measuring in at 90 miles in diameter. But more importantly for astro pointers, is the fact that it has an elevation of 9,800 feet. And that is 3,200 feet more than the rim. Climbing this mountain, we'll call it Mount Gertrude for convenience, should be a relatively straightforward affair. This moon's extremely low gravity means your most difficult challenge will be controlling the distance and force of your bounds. Once you reach the summit of Mount Gertrude, you will have a great view of the crater and the Titanian wilderness. Whether Mount Gertrude remains the highest point of Titania remains to be seen. For me, I don't think it would. There's just too much of this world that we haven't seen yet. But until we get a more comprehensive view of Titania, this peak will have to stand in for us. Reddish-colored Oberon is the second largest moon of the Uranian system, and it rounds out the bottom of our 10 largest moons list. For us, it is our final stop of our high-pointing adventure around this planet. Oberon is the furthest distant regular moon, taking 13 and a half days to revolve around the planet. Unlike its siblings, it is the only major moon to spend a good portion of its time outside of Uranus's magnetosphere, meaning it is bombarded by the solar wind from the sun. We only got a distant look at Oberon when Voyager 2 passed through the system. The closest it got to the moon was about 292,000 miles. Now to put this into a bit of perspective, our moon, on average, is about over 50,000 miles closer to us than what Voyager 2 was to Oberon. As you can imagine, that distance 
has created a little bit of a challenge when it comes to defining features on this moon's surface. The best spatial resolution, or the smallest an object can be to be defined compared to its surrounding objects, is three and a half miles. So it's safe to say that our knowledge of Oberon is minimal at best. With a limited view of this moon, astronomers have only positively defined two classes of geological features, canyons and craters. The canyons aren't as extensive as we've seen on the other Uranian moons. They could more likely be called giant cracks in Oberon's crust, brought about early in the moon's history as the icy mantle slowly froze and expanded. The largest and only named canyon is Mamer Chasma, stretching over 330 miles. As for craters though, well, Oberon has craters in spades. No moon in the Uranian system has more than this one. In fact, it's almost to the level of saturation where the new crater impacts are about the same as the old craters being destroyed. This high number of craters, and few other surface features on this moon, tells us a few things. One, this is a huge bit of evidence pointing to the fact that Oberon most likely has the oldest surface among its peers, and may well be the oldest of the major moons. Second, if Oberon ever had a resurfacing event, would have happened very early in its history. Third, Oberon has been very stable for a long time. A lot of Oberon's current landscape features have likely been shaped by external energy factors. The largest crater discovered on this impacted terrain is named Hamlet, and it measures about 128 miles in diameter. There is a bit of mystery about Oberon's craters, particularly their floors, because they're darker than they should be. Now, one of the going theories on why this is, is that when the crater was actually created, the force of the impact brought up a dirty liquid of sorts that then spread its way across. The truth is, this is yet another riddle that scientists can't really solve until we get a better look at this moon. You may think that our chances of finding a high point on this world would be a fool's errand, but in this case, you'd be wrong. Despite the challenges of distance and resolution, as Voyager 2 was speeding away, it spied and imaged a mountain on the limb, the edge of the disk. It was significant in height, with scientists originally estimating it to be about four miles in elevation, taller than Denali here on Earth. There are some newer estimates that range up to seven miles in height. That would be taller than Mount Achaea, the tallest mountain on the planet from base to peak. What makes this peak on Oberon even more intriguing is the fact that for some scientists, it bears some similarities to the equatorial ridge on Iapetus, particularly when that feature was first imaged by Voyager of all things, when it was known as the Voyager Mountains. The thought is that perhaps Oberon had just the right conditions that it too could create a moon-spanning ridge. Other thoughts are that this is a very large central peak in a crater. If that's the case, it may be unlike any crater we've seen in the outer solar system. Regardless, for our purposes, this unnamed Limb Mountain serves as our high point for the Iranian system. If you were able to stand on this peak right now, you'd have a view that no human has ever seen, looking out into the wilds of Oberon, truly an uncharted wilderness.
Uranus really is one of the big mysteries of our solar system. And for me, what's most interesting about it is the potential that this ice giant and its moons have. We only got that one tantalizing up close glimpse of it, but it was almost like trying to read a book on a table across the room and through a keyhole. But that was enough of a glimpse to fire the imagination of scientists and astronomers for decades. This is a world that deserves a more comprehensive look because I guarantee the most amazing things about this entire system have yet to be discovered. As we depart Uranus, we are well on our way to completing both of our lists. Our visit to Oberon lets us check off nine of the 10 highest peaks and nine of the 10 largest moons in our solar system. Now though, it's time to continue on through the realm of the ice giants, voyaging out to distant Neptune. I'm Scott Marthaler. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Rooftops of the Solar System. Before you go, click those like and subscribe buttons below, and I'll see you soon.